Evening, everybody. Evening, hey. Yeah. How Hi, are we everyone. Doing? Uh, I see. Oh, I've got the wrong. Let's see. I've David's got, got his guitar ready. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we'll be having a. We we'll have to get him on and do a session. Uh, uh, one I was going to say we, we've got a gap in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. How are we doing? Uh, I think everybody's now uh, out of the waiting room. Excellent evening, all. Uh, I hope you've had a good week. I hope it's been a bit drier for you than it has. Uh, well, certainly for myself and Grant in uh, uh, not so sunny Bedfordshire, but. Um, uh, I think the I think the rain gauge has uh, got washed away in the in the flood. It's done nothing but rain. Mm. Uh, I think it must be about three days now. So uh, anyway, uh, I hope it's been a bit better for you guys uh, wherever you are. Uh, okay, so tonight um, we are delighted to have uh, Richard Miller with us. Uh, Richard is a member of the forum. Um, Old Eyes, I think, is the um, uh, is his name. Right. Yep. Excellent, good. Uh, Richard's had a bit of a varied career. Uh, he's now a consultant in innovation, sustainability, and the future of cities. Uh, hopefully that also includes some uh, light pollution planning as well, but, um, uh, but perhaps not. Uh, although originally he trained, uh, trained as a chemist and uh, has had a, a long and illustrious career in research and development. Uh, Richard joined SGL back, and if uh, hopefully if the uh, dates are still correct, back in 2009, so uh, 11 years ago, if my maths is correct, and describes himself as a moderately incompetent astrophotographer. Uh, I'm sure it's not true, but it, I think that label goes to uh, uh, many of us, not um, uh, not yourself, Richard. So tonight, Richard is going to take us on a tale of how we get from a big bang and one or two elements up to uh, 118, 119, 118, I think it is, if I remember rightly, on today's world and uh, uh, how that uh, enables us to make up the world that we know. So, uh, Richard, we're going to pass it over to you. Oh, just to say, we're going to record as we do normally. Um, so this will be up there if uh, anybody can't watch it or wants to watch back at uh, some point in time. And as usual, if you've got some questions, throw them up in the chat and hopefully we'll come to you. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll come to you live, I think, uh, a bit later on uh, for your Q&A session at the end, Richard, if that's OK. No, that's fine. Excellent. So uh, I think I've covered all the admin then, finally. So in that case, then, I'll pass over to you. OK, thank you very much, guys. So just let me go straight in and share the screen. Uh, so that so I can get a thumbs up from someone. You can see that OK? Yes, yeah. we do again. Yeah. All right. So um, as I said in, my, in, in the, the kind of bio, I'm a professional chemist and a very amateur astronomer. And I, I want to try and link these two things together, the Big Bang and the periodic table. And um, let's try and there we go. All right. What will happen there? So this is a kind of thing. We, we, you probably had these on the wall of the classroom or the wall of the lab, and it was always kind of hanging up there, usually opposite uh, a picture of the British Empire in about 1920s for some reason. Um, but the, you know, this kind of image is familiar to us. And what I want to do is I, I want to link that to the early history of the universe and try and kind of put the two things together. And I want to put things together through this question. Where does all the matter in the universe come from? We start with hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium after the Big Bang, and we end up with all the elements in the periodic table. How? So we have the periodic table. It's an iconic image to generations. And 2019 was the 150th anniversary of the first development of the periodic table as we see it today. There are events all over the world, big conferences, lots of people getting together to talk about it. It's such an iconic image that it's been endlessly parodied. And so this one I found, this is the periodic table of musical genres. And you can find a periodic table of almost anything. So it's, it's an image that, that kind of people are used to and they can play with. And this is the periodic table we have today. So 118 elements, as was said, the last added in 2016. And if any of you are not terribly familiar with how it works, basically, uh, as you kind of go across, you're increasing the number of protons and electrons in each element, variable number of neutrons. So that's what's happening as the numbers go up. You're getting more and more protons, neutrons, and electrons forming the, the atoms. And the vertical columns are common chemistry. 
So things that are in vertical comms tend to behave the, generally the same kind of way. So for example, over here in this column, we've got fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And these are the halogens, and they all have a very kind of similar way. They're all gases, iodine, solid at room temperature, but they all easily form gases, very reactive, corrosive materials, tend to behave in the same kind of way. So that's basically what it does. Um, and the 20th century is when we get to understand why it looks like this. So just one other thing to point out is these two groups here fit into these gaps here. And the reason that's done is because otherwise it makes the paper too wide. So it's basically like the, uh, the Shetlands are always moved in much closer to Scotland in any map of the UK, because otherwise it's an inconvenient amount of space. So these fit in here. And this is all about the way the electrons are organized. And if anybody really wants to talk about that, we can do that later. Um, but there is now a clear understanding of why this is the structure and, and why things look the way they do. But it was developed without any of that. It was developed purely by observation of how the elements worked. So the 94 elements up to plutonium are the only ones that have ever been detected in the universe. Right? All of the other ones have been created in the laboratory and they're all highly unstable. And they're made by firing heavy nuclei at a, a target of a heavy metal. And it's a very, very kind of random process. It's a bit like filling a cannon with cake, firing it at a vat of cream, jam, and custard, and expecting to get a perfect trifle out of it. So, you, you know, you, lots and lots of collisions, very little happens. Um, this one here, Organesson. Uh, highly radioactive, has a half-life of less than a millisecond. Um, scientists are pretty confident that we've seen five atoms of it. There is a rumor of a sixth atom. So once we go out into the far reaches of the very, very heavy uh, elements, then, then stuff just gets really weird and uh, we're, we're dealing with materials that are purely the realm of physics and not much chemistry at all. So we're going to forget those because we don't see those in the universe. So we'll leave those out. These are the ones that are important. These are the naturally occurring elements. All these ones which are not shaded are metals. So they're typically shiny, electrical conductors, and they're, they have weakly bound electrons. So the atoms are kind of sitting in a sort of electron soup, and that's why they're conductive. The electrons can move around very easily, and that makes them conductive. These ones are the non-metals, the electrons are tightly bound, they're insulators. These ones here are the semiconductors. They can swing both ways. You can make them either conduct or not conduct. And that, of course, is the basis, basis of electronics. The ones outlined in red are the bulk elements of life. This is what our, most of our bodies are made out of, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, chlorine, sodium, magnesium, calcium, those kinds of materials. So these are the, the main bulk elements that life on Earth builds its bodies out of. And the green ones are the trace elements, which seem to be essential. And many of them are required in very, very tiny amounts. So vanadium, for example, the average uh, human body has 0.1 milligram per 100 kilograms. So a tiny, tiny amount. But it seems to be essential. If you don't have it, things go wrong with the body. So these are all the, uh, the, the minor elements that are important for life. A few of them, so francium, technetium, and astatine, have no stable isotopes. So they're just not really found on Earth very much. So Francium has a half-life of 22 minutes. It's formed by the breakdown of uranium. There are a couple of grams of it on the planet at any one time, and that's it. There's nothing more than that. So even within these naturally occurring ones, some of them are, are pretty rare. Um, and this is the book of our material world. This is what we build our world out of. If you want to find out more about the individual properties of elements, I highly recommend the series on YouTube called Periodic Videos. And this is Professor Sir Martin Polyakov, who has really excellent scientific hair, as you can see, high quality stuff there. 
And he just done this fantastic set of videos about all the elements and the true chemist style where possible, setting fire to things and blowing things up because that's, let's face it, the fun part of chemistry. And we used just about all of the periodic table. Um, two thirds of the periodic table alone are used in mobile phones. So we make good use of all the materials that we have available to us. So what's the history of the elements? So if you don't know, elements and materials can't be broken down into anything simpler using readily available methods, such as just heat, acid, solvents, electricity. These ones we knew in prehistory. They were fairly easy because they tended to be found lying about on the ground or were fairly easy to obtain from their ore. So this was kind of the, this were, these were the elements that were known to the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, that kind of thing. Even by 1750, we've only added a few more elements. It's still not a very rich collection. Uh, but some interesting ones have turned up. There's phosphorus. So phosphorus was discovered by uh, somebody called Hennig Brand in 1669. Uh, he was an alchemist, one of the last practicing alchemists. And he went through the fortunes of two wives searching for the philosopher's stone. So he had very understanding wives, I think, because basically he burned through two fortunes doing it. He obtained phosphorus by taking five and a half thousand liters of urine, allowing it to stand until it putrefied, and then boiling it down to a solid from which he distilled pure phosphorus. He got a couple of grams of phosphorus out of five and a half thousand liters of urine. I mean, the world's worst neighbor, you'd have to imagine. I mean, how awful would that be to have that going on near you? But anyway, so this is where we are in 1750. 100 years later, by 1850, we've got a much bigger collection of elements. A lot more have been discovered. Um, this is the enlightenment and the industrial revolution and we're really filling in some gaps and it's people like Humphrey Davy who did this and he said nothing tends so much to the advancement of knowledge as the application of a new instrument and he was great at grabbing the latest techniques and just seeing what he could find and he picked up on the work of Alessandro Volta and Luigi Galvani uh, Volta was the person who in invented the electric pile, the battery, so you had a portable source of electricity and people could start to play with it. And working in the Royal Institution in London, uh, he developed electrochemistry and in 1807 and 1808 he discovered eight elements uh, and proved that chlorine was an element. He maybe discovered iodine, there is a priority dispute over that, but he, he went on beyond that. He developed the electric arc, and incandescent lighting. Um, he was a poet, he was a, a friend and, and, and partner of Robert Southey and Samuel Coleridge Taylor. He was very big into laughing gas. And the three of them used to have these most amazing laughing gas parties in which they would become hugely intoxicated with this material. And being of an experimental turn of mind, he tried one or two other things. So on one occasion, he, in he uh, inhaled four quarts of carbon monoxide. Um, managed to just about drag himself out of the room and sort of lay on the lawn, nearly expiring. Um, so he decided that he'd, he'd give, give uh, carbon monoxide a pass in future. It didn't appear to give any particularly good feeling. Stick with the good old nitrous oxide. That's much more fun. He was involved in popular and exciting and often dangerous lectures at the Royal Institution. So this is an 1802 Gilray co cartoon. And uh, Davy is the, the man standing behind the demonstration bench on the right with the rather alarming looking grin on his face uh, and holding the, um, I don't know what that device is, but it doesn't look very, uh, very pleasant. And they would carry out these demonstrations of things like nitrous oxide, the latest understanding to the, uh, the rich and famous of London town. Of course, he also invented the Davy lamp. Um, Although there was, again, one, a priority dispute. He was a very disputatious kind of scientist. He had a big dispute with George Stevenson. Uh, I understand to this day in the northeast of England, it's called a Stevenson lamp, not a Davy lamp. Um, so, you yeah, know, some things don't change. 
His assistant was Faraday, Michael Faraday, perhaps even more important than Davy. He took Davy's electrical work and took it forward. Uh, he built the first electric motors, dynamos, electromagnets, and all of that came out of the work that uh, Faraday was doing at the Royal Institution. He was also a passionate communicator. He set up the Christmas lectures in 1825. And um, one of those was a very famous one, was given in 1860, the chemical history of a candle. He squeezed six one hour lectures out of what happens in a candle, all of the known chemistry of the age packaged into that single candle flame. Um, and it's actually just, a, a, I have read it, it is an astonishing piece of science communication, absolutely brilliant. So here we are in 1850, we've got the majority of the elements, but we have no structure, we have no logic. And people are trying all kinds of ways to kind of arrange the elements to help remember what properties they have and to try and make ses sense of them and to show the different relationships. And there are literally hundreds of different versions of how you would organize the elements. Most of them had a bit of a logic to them, but they didn't really work. They didn't really tell you what was going on. So along comes Dmitry Mendeleev. He's the professor of chemistry at St. Petersburg University. And he's trying to write a textbook for undergrads. So he needs a, a, a table, a pattern, something which can go into an image which he can use to teach chemistry to undergraduates. So like undergraduates all, I mean, I used to teach medics preliminary chemistry and they really don't want to learn it. They think they're there to study medicine. So you've got to try and make it palatable and interesting. And he was trying to find a way of doing this. And so he, he, he traveled widely and he used to carry around a deck of cards with all the different elements on them and their properties, their melting point, their chemistry, things like that. And he would kind of deal them out in a chemical patients, trying all kinds of arrangements. And the story is that the structure that became the periodic table came to him in a dream. Um, which I take with a grain of salt because it seems to be any brilliant idea in chemistry always is assumed to have come to them in a vision or a dream. Um, so I'm not quite sure I believe that one. But anyway, he came up with a structure. And this is 1869. This is the first sketch of the periodic table. And it's actually written on the back of an invitation to inspect a cheese factory. So he's, this is original note. Uh, first kind of inklings of what was going on. And then by 1871, it's starting to look more familiar. We're starting to see those groups that go together, the logic of them, the uh, atomic numbers, things like that. It's, it's starting to make sense. And in particular, if you look at this bit down the side here, that's kind of, if you've turned that through 90 degrees, that's kind of looks a bit like a modern periodic table. So why? Mendeleev, why not any of the others who were playing around with these ideas? The genius of Mendeleev was in prediction. He actually created a structure that had gaps in it for elements that had not yet been discovered. So the ones in yellow here, scandium, technetium, gallium and germanium, particularly these two, were not known at the time he created the periodic table. And he predicted that they would exist he predicted their atomic weights, he predicted what kind of chemistry they would show, and he predicted what kind of um, reactions they would go through, what kind of melting point they would have, whether they would be metals, all those kinds of things. Um, so it was a work of genius to actually spot that you could actually make the patterns work if you left gaps for these elements which had not been yet discovered. And that's why Mandelaev is seen as the father of the periodic table, the person who really cracked it. Um, sadly, he never gets the Nobel Prize. And the reason he never gets the Nobel Prize is because he really annoyed Svante Arrhenius, who was a Swedish chemist at the time, who was very famous, um, and was actually the first person to predict global warming, and said that if we actually kept pumping CO2 into the atmosphere, we would get global warming. So that was in about 1870. But he was dead set against Mendeleev for reasons we don't fully understand. And so Mendeleev never actually gets a Nobel Prize, which is a bit tragic. One last story about the elements on Earth before we get into what's happening in the universe. And this is about a small village called Utterby, I'm told by, by uh, Swedes, uh, on an island in the Stockholm archipelago. 
tiny little village, it has seven elements named after it. Why? And here they are. So there's yttrium, um, erbium, terbium, iterbium. At that point, they run out of syllables. So they move on to holmium, which is named after Stockholm, thurium, which is the mythical land to the north of Sweden, uh, Ultima Thule, and gadolinium, which is named after Johan Gadolin, who was the scientist who did most of the work. So these seven elements were found in this tiny village. And they were found in some odd rocks, a small amount, from this mine in the later 19th century. They weren't looking for metals. They were mining feldspar. So what did they need feldspar for? So if we wind the clock back to 1700, Johann Friedrich Botka is not the prosperous burger we see in this picture. He's an 18-year-old apothecary's apprentice. He's an alchemist. He announces he can make gold. What is slightly odd that his master doesn't ever seem to have questioned him on this. If he was able to make gold, how come he was a po impoverished apothecary's apprentice? Anyway, he claims he can make gold. Frederick I of Prussia is very keen on gold, and so he has Botka arrested because Frederick I of Prussia has been bitten by alchemists before. And so he has a tendency to imprison them until they make gold and then execute them if they don't. So Botka escapes from Prussia to Saxony, helped by Augustus II, the ruler of Saxony, who is also keen on gold, and then arrests him. He spends three years in a dungeon lab trying to make gold. He escapes. He is recaptured. He is threatened with execution, but it's not, but not yet. And Augustus appoints uh, a court scientist, a guy called von Schoenhaus, to oversee the work and gives them basically eight days to make progress or that's it. We're going to execute vodka. So they kind of work together and try and figure out what to do and decide that they're not going to make gold. But there's something else which uh, Augustus is interested in, and that's white gold, porcelain. At this stage, porcelain is the uh, monopoly of the Chinese, and it's incredibly valuable. So they rapidly set, they've got some ideas, some work's been done, they rapidly set to trying to make white gold, and they succeed. I don't think it's within the eight days, but they show enough progress that uh, Botka is spared, and they make porcelain. And they need feldspar for that. At this point, when everyone's about to get rewarded and made into dukes and all this kind of stuff, Von Schoenhaus dies suddenly. And then there's some very dubious dealings with Botka and the executor, where Botka rushes to the house and seizes the will and all the notes. And that enables Botka to claim to be the sole inventor of this version of porcelain. And that leads to the Meissen factory, which is started in 1813. Some of the most hideous ceramics known to history. And that, of course, leads directly to the Antiques Roadshow. So that's kind of the history of how we got the periodic table and how by observation of what we could see on Earth, we made sense of it. But we still haven't answered the question of where does all this stuff come from? So April 1961, there's a six-year-old boy is inspired to become a spaceman, becomes obsessed. And my mother and uh, my aunt pulled a really mean trick on me because my mother made a fairly repellent stew of minced beef, onions, and pearl barley, which I detested. And they both swore an oath to me that this was spaceman soup. And everybody knew that this is what spacemen trained on. So I've never quite forgiven them for that. But anyway, I decided to be prepared to, for the interview for the space program by knowing all about space. And that leads to an interest in astronomy. Now, this is in London, east end of London. London is not great. I have a very narrow view between the houses and lots of light pollution. So I got pretty good at the summer triangle and Orion, but that was about it. But I'm fascinated by the immensity of it all and the way things work. 
you know, the sun is big. It would hold a million Earths. If the sun was a dot on an eye on a paperback page, the Milky Way would be as big across as the Earth. I mean, that's huge. 100,000 light years side to side, 250 billion stars, the immensity of it. And, you know, looking at something like the, the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, I mean, that's a picture two arc minutes square. It contains about five and a half thousand galaxies. If that kind of density is repeated across the sky, we're looking at 180 billion galaxies visible from Earth across the sky. 60% of those that are visible are more than 9 billion years old, and the oldest are 13.2 billion years old. So we have this immense history, and we have this immense space and structures going on within it, and some of them we're familiar with. You know, we're familiar with nebulae emitting light. We're used to seeing hydrogen emission type thing, gas clouds. We're used to galaxies, the Andromeda galaxy. And this is how we understand what is out there. When I said we've, we've detected 94 elements in the universe, it's looking at the light from objects like this. And it's basic spectroscopy. You know, we're all familiar with the sodium yellow glare, the copper green glare and all the other colors that go on to make fireworks, well, of course, we can make look at light from any object. This is the solar spectrum, and those dark lines are specific transitions in particular atoms, and we can actually analyze what's in any particular star, any galaxy, any gas cloud. Um, with things like the Chandra X-ray Observatory, you can do the same thing with X-rays, so we get very, very good information about what's out there. And we see all these elements. The question is, where do they come from? Because whenever we see Brian Cox standing on a peak, staring meaningfully into the distance and talking about the birth of the universe 13.8 billion years ago, all the matter and energy in the universe erupts into being, but it isn't the elements of the periodic table. That's not where we start. Now, I know we're all supposed to use the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, but I must confess, I don't really get on with it. I find it quite difficult to understand my way around when thinking about stellar life cycles. So I think this image is actually, in many ways, much easier to understand. You know, is it a very small star, a low mass star, a big star? What kind of transitions can it go through? Where does it end up? Even better is this one because this shows the recycling of material from one generation of stars to the next. And that recycling, as stars end their life and dump their material back into the interstellar gas clouds, that's essential to getting this diversity of materials in the universe. So, the Big Bang. Um, before 10 seconds, the physics is just weird and I don't understand it. And anyway, it doesn't really do anything in terms of creating elements. So we'll forget that. 10 seconds to 20 minutes, the universe has cooled down enough that actually atoms can form. So these are still the nuclei of atoms with electrons separately. So it's a plasma like the gas that's in a discharge tube. But the atoms begin to form. And that's the only point at which the processes of the Big Bang themselves lead directly to elements. Because by the time you reach that 20 minutes, the universe is too cold for fusion to go on and direct fusion to go on anymore. So in that first burst of activity, we're creating all of the hydrogen, helium, and that little bit of lithium that is our starting soup. The interesting thing is that only 2% of the available hydrogen and helium has been converted to other elements in the last 13 billion years. So we create the atoms. About 100,000 years, we keep on cooling down, we get the first molecules begin to form. 370,000 years is a critical point. That's where the uh, universe has cooled down enough that electrons and the nuclei they've been ripped from can recombine and you get the first neutral atoms. That's called the recombination period, and that's really important in terms of understanding the universe and the history of the universe, 
because you can't see through a plasma. Light doesn't go through plasmas. So 370,000 years after the Big Bang is the first time that light can actually penetrate through the universe. And that's the date of the cosmic microwave background. Then you go on, 200, 500 million years thereabouts, the first stars and galaxies are forming. Some may be as early as 100 million years, but in that, that kind of period. And by about a billion years, the universe is beginning to look pretty much the way we see it today. So we have a universe filled with hydrogen and helium. And you get slow gas clouds form, slow gravitational collapse until the pressure is so great, pushes up the temperature, that hydrogen fusion ignites at about 4 million degrees. And when stars ignite, they often kind of splutter into life and you get jets from rotating stars. So this is an object called Herbig Harrow 24 in the Orion molecular gas cloud. And it's showing these kind of spluttering jets as the star begins to light off. So this is the very, very early stages of a star beginning to form. And the thing about the stars in the early universe is that they tend to be big. Because the universe is still quite warm, you need more matter to overcome the kinetic energy of the gas and begin to clump together to form a protostar. So the stars are big. And the thing we know about big stars today is they don't live very long. You know, live young, sorry, live fast, die young. That's what happens to stars. So what's going on in something about a 15 solar mass star is at 4 million degrees, we're converting hydrogen into helium takes about 20 million years will be a typical period spent there. Run out of hydrogen fuel, star starts to shrink again, it's collapsing on itself under gravitational forces, that provides kinetic heating again, temperature goes up, and when we get to about 100 million degrees, helium starts to fuse, and you start to get carbon and oxygen. And that lasts a few million years. Go up Again, run out of, use up most of the helium, you start to get carbon fusing at 600 million degrees, and that lasts about a thousand years. You might have noticed that the lifespans are getting shorter and shorter. And the reason the lifespans are getting shorter and shorter is because the pressure is getting bigger and bigger, and you need more and more energy, and things happen to have, have to be driven faster in order to stop the star collapsing in on itself. So the equilibrium position is burning fuel pretty fast goes on. Oxygen can burn to silicon and sulfur, 2 billion degrees. That, se that sequence only lasts weeks. And then silicon can burn to iron, 3 billion degrees, a period that lasts days. And so what you end up with a massive star nearing the end of its life is a star with onion layers. The core cannot fuse any further because Iron is an awkward sticking point in the fusion process. It now takes more energy to fuse iron than you get given out in the fusion reaction. Hydrogen is chucking out when it fuses, chucking out loads of energy. Yeah, helium the same. Once you get to iron, it demands energy. And so you've got this body in the center of this complex structure that is no longer putting out enough energy to kind of support the gravitational forces on top of it. And what happens now is you get a sudden core collapse. The pressure, the overpressure from the materials outside and the gravitational forces overcome the ability of the core to hold itself up. So there are two stages. The first stage, um, you get electron degeneracy pressure. So you just can't push the electrons close enough to each other. They don't like doing that. And that actually becomes a force that holds things up, keeps things stable. Go much more pressure than that, and the electrons will start to fuse. The temperature has gone up to hundreds of billions of degrees. The electrons start to fuse with the protons and turn into neutrons. And then you get that sudden massive collapse of the core. And when that happens, the outer layers fall in this incredibly fast process, and they actually bounce off this now neutron star core. And they're hurled out with enormous 
energy in a hundred billion degree explosion. And it leaves behind a neutron star, typically about one to one and a half solar masses, about 20 kilometers across. That's your type two core collapse supernova. And of course, it's throwing all the materials that it's been synthesizing over its lifespan, being hurled out into the surroundings. So this is Cassiopeia A, seen in the uh, Chandra X-ray Observatory. And they've actually tagged the different elements that you can see. So here, the red is silicon, the yellow is sulfur, the uh, green is calcium, the purple is iron, and the blue around the edge is actually the blast front from the supernova. So these young early stars that formed early in the universe, they actually go through a process of sending lots of interesting material out into the gas clouds and into the rest of the universe. And that gets recycled and used again in other stars. A much smaller star, like a solar mass star, can't do that. It never gets hot enough. So it burns hydrogen to helium, 4 million degrees, about 10 billion years. Then it will start to burn helium, and that occurs at about 100 million degrees, and that takes 100 million years. And when that runs out, there's not enough mass to create the gravitational force to drive the next set of fusion reactions. So it just kind of stops. And that's actually when it turns into a red giant. And the processes that are going on lead to that expansion of the cloud. And it gradually, over time, blows off much of its mass and leaves behind a white dwarf. And the white dwarf is held up by that electron degeneracy. So this is the Cat's Eye Nebula. And you know it's beautiful. You can see the layers of material being blown out. Not nearly as exciting in terms of the variety of elements as you get out of a core collapse supernova, but just gently pushing out you know, helium and some carbon and some oxygen and nitrogen out into the surroundings. It's a very gentle process. However, it can go another step. So a white dwarf can form in a binary pair with another star. It can be another white dwarf, can be a red giant and it can pull material from its partner and add it to its own mass. And what that's doing, there's the white dwarf sitting there supported by electron degeneracy forces, not doing anything in the way of further uh, fusion, just kind of sitting there being very hot. Add more mass and gradually you get enough mass to start that process off again, to trigger fusion again. And it's something called the Chandrasekhar limit that says once you reach about 1.4 solar masses, if you're a white dwarf, there's so much gravitational force, you then go to a new, you then attempt to go to a neutron star. So the temperature rockets. In a few seconds, the temperature soars to 100 billion degrees, and that is a type 1a supernova. The star is completely destroyed. It's smashed to smithereens and scatters material out. So again, we're seeing the same reactions, all those production of silicon, sulfur, calcium, iron, the things you saw in the Cassiopeia A, that happens in the type 1A supernova as well. But we've only got as far as iron, because that was the biggest element that was created in those, those early processes. So we need a way of getting more. Now, you can go a bit beyond iron because the forces in those type two supernova are so high as they kind of rip through the cloud of other materials that they do actually create some other elements as well. But really not much beyond iron. And we've got to get a lot, lot way further. So how do we do that? And there is a process that does that. It's called neutron capture. And it's a very elegant, simple idea that says, if you add a neutron, you can, you can add a neutron to a nucleus of any element and it might be stable or it might be unstable. If it's unstable, it might undergo beta decay. And beta decay releases an electron and neutrino and converts a neutron into a proton. And that, of course, moves the element to the next highest element. So if you keep on firing in protons progressively, then you can actually 
do the nucleosynthesis, you can go from element to element. And if those early supernova have seeded things like iron and chromium and other materials into the gas clouds that form the next stars, then you can use this process to go to, go to the higher levels. So here's an example. Uh, this is silver. You add, um, go through that process, neutron capture followed by beta decay, you get to cadmium, you then go through several isotopes of cadmium, and then you can oh, do the same thing again, you get up to indium and tin and antimony. So this can gradually build up. So what we need is seed atoms from those earlier supernova, and we also then need a source of neutrons. And there are two sources that we can find in the universe. The first is, dying low mass stars, those asymptotic, asymptotic giant branch red giants, the kind of thing that our sun is going to turn into. This is a, a simulation of what's going on, on the surface. And there's a huge amount of convection going on in these stars. So you've got that core of carbon and things like that. You've got uh, helium, you've got other materials there. They join together and you can actually uh, go through a process that generates a stream of neutrons. Uh, so neutrons are constantly being generated in these dying uh, low mass stars and they can then do this nuclear uh, neutron capture process and can produce higher elements. Uh, so carbon-13 can uh, react with helium to give you oxygen-16 which then spits out a neutron and that gives you what's called the slow neutron capture process. The limit on that is element 83 bismuth because the thing about bismuth is it just won't do neutron capture anymore. As soon as you try, it just spits out uh, an alpha particle and drops back a couple of numbers in the periodic table and waits to be built up again. So it becomes a hard limit. So how do we get beyond that? The most wild processes imaginable. Neutron star merger or neutron star merging with a black hole. The energy involved in this is so enormous that it rips the stars apart completely. The tidal forces rip the stars apart and create a huge number of neutron captures. And because of the explosive nature of the interaction, that material is ejected very rapidly uh, and, and very fast into the surroundings. And that's what produces gravity waves. So we've only recently been observing this phenomena, but those gravity waves have now been detected. I think kind of think, that's a weird process because this goes up, this can create elements all the way up to 250. Most of those are wildly unstable and will collapse very, very quickly. But that's how you get some of the higher uh, atomic numbers through this kind of process. This is called rapid neutron capture. Um, and it sounds bizarre because what are the chances that two supernova, Core collapse supernova, type two supernova, happen so close to each other, they can form a binary pair of neutron stars that can then orbit each other, collapse in together, merge and create a giant explosion. But it turns out in the early universe, it was quite common because we have all these large mass stars. So I think that's the most bizarre process, which is leading to further elements. What about you know, galactic jets, hypernova, accretion disks around black holes? They don't seem to add much to the story, um, basically because they're not dense enough. They don't have this density of where things are happening. They're throwing out a lot of cosmic rays, and they can cause what's called uh, nuclear spallation. That can actually knock bits off other atoms, and that's how we get some of the other elements that can't be made directly from fusion but they don't have enough of a neutron flux for a synthesis to go beyond the IMP. So they're very dramatic objects, very energetic. You know, collapsars and all these wonderful exotic objects out there, enormous amounts of energy, but it's not quite the right kind of energy for synthesizing the elements. And so when we're looking back in space, looking in time with, with the Hubble, uh, extreme field. You know, we're looking back at the galaxies and stars that were going through those early processes that ultimately generated all this material which we now use to build our mobile phones, our computers, our telescopes, our houses, and to build us. And so bringing it all together, 
this is the kind of best guess of where all the elements in the periodic table came from. So Big Bang fusion, that very first 10 minutes, hydrogen, helium, little lithium. Some of them, like beryllium, boron, come from this cosmic wave fission process where you're breaking bits off. Here we've got the massive stars exploding and exploding white dwarfs, the type, one, uh, sorry, type 1a and type 2 supernova. This lot, so you can go beyond iron, but not by very much. And then down here, we've got these really weird processes. You've got the dying low mass stars gradually, slowly building up the elements by neutron capture. And then this wild process of merging neutron stars generating these materials here. And then they've colored in gray the ones that are so radioactive that we haven't got anything left over from stars. We only see those in the laboratory on Earth. One of the things that I just find astonishing about this diagram is this little group here. So these are the rare earth elements. And these are critical to modern life, to modern technology. These are the materials we make LEDs out of. These are the materials we use to make our fiber optics and our lasers and our optical amplifiers. These are the materials that go into our smartphones. These are the materials that make the high performance magnets that drive our wind, that take the power from our wind turbines, that drive our electric vehicles that means you can have a tiny loudspeaker in your mobile phone. And the bulk of these came from neutron star mergers. And I think out of the whole periodic table, that's the process that just strikes me as, wow, how did that ever happen? How likely is that? So just to finish, to quote Carl Sagan, the nitrogen in our DNA the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made, were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are all made of star stuff. And for me, that's one of the most exciting things about looking out there at those objects, at those distant objects, and thinking about the processes that are going on there and their relationship to the stuff that our world is made out of. Thank you very much. Excellent, Richard. Thank you uh, very much indeed. Uh, very informative. Um, uh, lots of information, uh, lots of information there. And, uh, and I guess, uh, jumping in, I understood some of that, but, but uh, I, I understood up to the iron piece, at least, <laughs> or at least I knew that before. I could never then work out what actually, what actually happened afterwards. So, uh, so I've certainly learned something. So th that's great. Um, so on the chat, there's been an ongoing, uh, ongoing discussion about uh, temperature so i'm just looking to see where we uh got to um who actually asked the question roger i think you asked the uh question um originally about um is there a maximum temperature so roger if you can unmute yourself uh you that, could... thank you there you go yeah. ask Excellent. away uh, uh, just just very very briefly i'm uh, a guest from the cpac who uh, kind of you invited i got onto this um, yeah, the telephone number temperatures you were getting made me think that there must be a limit to the top temperature that one can achieve. And uh, uh, Steve, it was that suggested what I was thinking, that when the particles start reaching the speed of light, it ain't going to get any hotter because the cooling will equal the, the heating, if you like. Yeah. Um, so there is a theoretical limit. Whether there's a practical limit, I guess, is another question. So the theoretical limit is the temperature at which physics stops working altogether. So this is a temperature associated with the very, you know, with the 10 to minus 30 second of a second of the Big Bang, right? When all right. the laws of physics don't work properly. And that yeah. theoretical limiting temperature is about 10 to the 32 Kelvin. <laughs> So it's a lot bigger. And we're dealing, you know, this, this stuff, all this stuff is happening in the cooler parts of the universe. I mean, 100 billion is nothing, you know. I mean, it's... <laughs> uh, indeed. I, I'm not sure I could ever write 32 zeros and, and actually know I've written 32 zeros. That's uh, uh, That's fantastic. Isn't it? Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Excellent, Roger. Uh, great question. Thanks very much indeed. Um, 
Uh, I've got uh, uh, host privilege, I think. So um, when you when you spoke earlier, Richard, about uh, about those very early elements, the um, the one called FR, I forget what the actual name was. Francium, yeah. Yeah, there's only ever a few grams of this uh, of this stuff. How the heck do you detect that sort of uh, that sort of quantity? Um, well, actually, if if you take a lump of uranium, you will find a small amount of francium in it, and they use it do it using a mass spectrometer. So oh, basically, okay. you vaporize the sample, you you ionize it, and then you fire it down a vacuum tube with a dirty great magnet around it, and the charged particle bends in the magnetic field. And how far it bends depends on how fast it's going and how heavy it is. And so you can separate out and, and see what you've got, you know, in, in terms of, of, uh, of, of the element number. So that's sure, how they okay. do it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So I'm, drawing, I'm drawing a mental picture of little things flying along a tube and then yeah, basically yeah. being pulled off. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So if you remember the, the kind of... Uh, the famous kind of Crookes experiment where you fire a beam of electrons onto a, a target, like a phosphor target of a television. Yeah. And that they were bent by a magnetic field. That's how the old CRT televisions worked. You know, fire a beam of electrons and then make it sweep around by changing the magnetic field. Yeah. It's basically the same thing. So electrons are very light. So it's very easy to do, but these things are pretty heavy. So obviously bigger, heavier equipment to make it work. Cool. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, lots of people, I have to say, there's lots of people on the chat saying it was a, a brilliant talk, really interesting. So uh, I'll pass that comment on most certainly. Um, and, and a couple of people wishing you were there. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Um, uh, good evening. Happy cat. I know you don't always have a microphone, Kate. Are you able to ask your question? I think that's. I'm going to think that's. Uh, no, okay, no <laughs> microphone. <laughs> right, okay, we got there in the end. Right, in that case, then I will ask uh, for you. Oh, I've just lost it now. Where the hell has it got? Right, how successful is element reclaiming from recycled mobile phones, for example? Um, yeah, and, and then also, please refresh me. What was the year that the last element was added to the table? Our last element was added, now you've got me going now, thinking 2018, I think. 2018. 2016 or 2018. Okay, I mean, there the, we go. You know, the evidence has been around for some time, but it takes the uh, International Union of Plural and Applied Chemistry some time to go, yeah, that's really there, we believe in it, <laughs> uh, and to put their imprimatur on it. Right, okay. Um, okay. So that, that was the last time anything was added. Uh, cool. And the other question was... Just... Um, how successful is element reclaiming from things like mobile phones? Um, not very in the case of mobile phones. Um, the, the problem is that the materials they want to really want to retrieve are not avail not there in very much amount. It's 0.1 of a gram, for example, of rare earth magnets is in a mobile phone. And there are millions of billions of mobile phones. And so how would you get at it becomes a problem. Much more successful with things like wind turbines. So it's 500 kilograms of rare earth magnet per megawatt of output, very roughly. Um, so it's a big lump in a big wind turbine. And sure. so that gets carefully recycled. Um, the, the boundary at the moment, the interesting boundary, appears to be hard disks. So they have these very powerful little electromagnet systems for moving the heads around. And um, there's enough rare earth material in there to make it worth attempting to recover from uh, from disk. So there are two approaches to doing that. Um, one is called hydrogen crepitation, where you expose the whole hard disk to um, hydrogen at high pressure, and that actually breaks down the rare earth magnet into a dust, and you can literally just shake it out. So that's kind of one approach. And then the Americans have got this really sophisticated system where it has a complete database of all of the known hard disk systems. And it can do image analysis and the hard disks go along a, a um, conveyor belt and it lines them up and then it can punch out precisely the place out of the whole hard disk where the material is. Um, Quite frankly, I've got more faith in the hydrogen crepitation method than I have in actually being able to keep up with all the hard disks in the world. But, but hard disks is kind of the boundary of where it's being done at the moment. So electric cars, yes. 
electric bicycles, yes. Uh, wind turbines, absolutely. Big heavy industrial equipment, absolutely. Hard disks, kind of on the cusp. Mobile phones, just not enough stuff to make it economically viable. Excellent. Okay, uh, understood. Okay, I hope that answers uh, your question. I'm sorry, somebody is not on mute and there's a TV or something going on in the background. <laughs> That's it. Ah, there we go. Thank you, Steve. Uh, okay, uh, question from uh, Steve Richards. Oh, good evening, Steve. How are you? Over to you, sir. Unmute yourself and ask your question if you'd be so kind. Yeah, my question is, um, is there a, a physical limit to the number of elements that we could produce in the laboratory if we had enough energy? Or is there, um, if you like, an infinite number that we could do if we had sufficient power to do so? Uh, we don't know is the answer. Um, there were great hopes that uh, there would be an island of stability, it was called. That as so we, we were making all these transuranic elements and they were proving to be more and more radioactive but there were there were good chemical reasons and physics reasons for thinking that if you could get to the right structure it would suddenly be stable but we've gone all the way up to 118 and haven't found it and that was kind of you know all the big push for 116 117 118 was looking for this island of stability and it doesn't seem to be there so we can certainly make potentially bigger atoms bigger elements briefly but they don't hang around uh, and there's a question of how long does it have to hang around to make it worthwhile calling it an element so, as I said, the organesson, which is element 118, has a half-life of about 0.8 milliseconds. So, you know, yeah. basically, you, you spot it and then it's gone. Now, there may well be that, that island of stability out there, but, you know, the theory was we should have hit it already and we haven't. So there's something we don't understand going on. But we can keep going. Okay. Uh, 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 presumably then, uh, Richard, these are sort of experiments that are coming out from uh, the Large Hadron Collider? Not really. The Large Hadron Collider is, is doing a different kind of physics. These are specialist devices uh, designed to accelerate heavy atoms. The, 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 you know, the, the Large Hadron Collider and, and its, its predecessors, you know, is dealing with, with, with protons and antiprotons uh, very light objects at very, very high speeds. These are much bigger objects traveling somewhat slower. Okay. So they have specialized, it's the same kind of thing, but just not as big or as powerful because you're trying to not break things. You kind of want to, like I said, you, you, when you smash the two nuclei together, they sort of wobble like a jelly. Okay. And if it wobbles too much, it'll break apart. So if you want it to stick together, you've got to get exactly the right energy. So it's basically two places where it's done. It's done at the uh, Lawrence um, Berkeley Laboratory in California and the Joint Nuclear Research Facility in Dubna near Moscow. Good stuff. And those, stuff. those two have produced all of, the, all of them sort of in recent years. Okay. Okay. Understood. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's nothing else on the chat, so I'm going to have another host question, if, uh, if that's okay. Um, when you spoke about the, um, the ejection of materials and obviously the, the, the various processes, the various fusion processes that the different layers go through, what percentage, or is there, is there an approximate percentage of, of uh, how much of those different layers are, are consumed in each of its um, uh, uh, reaction process? Good question, to which I don't know the answer. Um, I think so. The the to want to start to start burning helium, you've got to get rid of most of the hydrogen. To burn, then then the you go to the carbon nitrogen oxygen group. You know the temperature is going up again. My guess is that by the time you reach iron, it's not a big part of the mass because you've got these outer layers which mm -hmm. are kind of bearing down on it. But I, I don't have a number off the top of my head. Sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, no, not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. Um, oh, there's another one coming. Uh, David Swan. David, are you able to um, ask your question? Uh, 
No mic. No, no mic. Okay, no worries. Okay, I, okay. Can, I can see the question. You can see the question. So I'll, I'll just read it out then just for the purposes yeah, yeah. of the recording. So um, have we reached the point at which uh, periodic, periodicity, no, periodicity, periodicity <laughs> breaks down uh, due to relative... Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Grant, you have a go at that one. Uh, uh, breaks down due to relative stick effects in the electron shells. <laughs> um, I'm, breaking, I'm breaking these teeth in for somebody else. That's my problem. I think the answer is no. Um, because if you look at the last few elements which have been uh, picked up, we only have a few atoms, only had a few atoms of them, but they did seem to behave as you would expect for elements in that period. So the, the, the periods uh, that he's talking about, those are the vertical columns in the periodic table. And th those periods are um, governed by how many protons and how many electrons you've got. And there are particular rules about how the electrons can be organized that give rise to the shape of, of the structure. And in general, I think so far, yeah, I, I think we're still showing periodic effects. But who knows what happens if we go even further? This is where we start getting into into the weird, the weird part of chemistry and uh, and physics yeah. and uh, yeah. As yeah. soon as somebody starts talking about relativistic effects in the electron shells, I'm kind of going, okay, physicist, not my field anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll give you we'll give you a break to research that one, and you can uh, you can come back to yeah, that. I think I think as far as I know, organesson is kind of behaving pretty much as we would expect. But of course, we don't have much chemistry to go with because we only ever had five atoms. So um, I think that yeah, there are other reasons to believe it is behaving pretty much as you would expect. But that if we could get enough of it, we could start testing whether it actually behaves like a noble gas. Um, my gut feeling would be it might well be a bit different, but who knows? Uh, <laughs> yes, right, they... we've got physicist insults coming in now. <laughs> Come on, Steve, unmute yourself then. I hope shutting the door has uh, killed the TV noise. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. earlier. Yeah, I'm I just, just making the point that um, chemistry is really only the physics of the outer electrons anyway. You know, and, and biology is really only the, the, the chemistry of uh, carbon. So, you know, it's, it's all physics, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Try talking to some mathematicians sometimes, Steve, and see where it gets you. <laughs> I was one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yes, I mean, you know, that, that for me is the interesting part, is the blending of physics and chemistry, because once you've got the elements, the things you do with them don't really involve all these wonderful things that are happening in the nuclei and these brilliant processes. But it's just fascinating to me how they get there. So we can play and do chemistry things with them. And the answer to the next question from, from Kate is, no, the hyd Hadron Collider doesn't get used for this kind of experiment because it's just doing the wrong yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, with specialist laboratories, specialist equipment using what look like miniature large hadron colliders, very much smaller, and it's all about smashing together these very wobbly large nuclei in a way that they don't immediately fall apart again. Excellent. There was a, uh, if I can just answer a question I saw earlier on, which may have been me not being clear. Somebody okay. asked the question, how, how could you have um, molecules form before atoms. And the point is that the, before that 370 kilo year after the Big Bang point, which you get recombination, there are atoms, but they're ionized. Right? So their electrons have been stripped off. So you can actually form molecular structures between two dissimilar nuclei, even before you've got uh, neutral atoms. But that's the key thing. Once you've got the neutral atoms, the kind of processes that I'm interested in, um, start to start to dominate and start and so matter starts to become the dominant material rather than particles yes, thank you very flying much. around. Does that help, Roger? Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Not a problem. Not a problem. Uh, and I think then in that case there are 
no other questions that have come in via the chat. So I think uh, I, I think let Richard, Richard go have a drink after that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, that absolutely was, uh, brilliant. That was superb. That was so entertaining, Richard. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I was. I, I've definitely learned some. Uh, so I've made notes as I've been going through. So uh, uh, it doesn't happen very often, I have to say. But thanks very much. It's just fascinating to see a different view of it all as well, and a different way of looking at the the night sky. It's really, really entertaining. Thank you very much, Richard. Yeah, I mean, you, when you start, you're looking at the at the Orion Nebula, looking at the trapezium area, and you're thinking, oh, it's a stellar nursery, and thinking, okay, so the stuff in there came from a whole bunch of supernova earlier on in the life of the universe, you know, and it's coming together, and there's actually new materials being synthesized right now. So the whole composition of the universe will carry on changing until we reach the point where things have cooled down so much and separated so much that we don't get star formation anymore. While there are stars being formed, we will keep on creating more of these heavier and more complex and rich elements. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, well, indeed. Yeah. And I think also the, the, the other bit is the way you talk about it as well, Richard. I think that's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah, I sorry, it, passion. Nothing I can do about that. No, no. Uh, the other really interesting point was we've only, uh, if I've got this right, we've only used up two percent of the um, hydrogen and helium that's, uh, that's available anyway. So there's still a fair bit to go at. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Grant, before we disappear, uh, yeah. what's on next week's agenda? Well, we've got that. We've got that heckler, Steve. Steve Tonkin next week. <laughs> 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 um, Steve's joining us again. Thank you, Steve. And he's going to be. Um, talking about um, binoculars this time so he's doing his two eyes are better than one choosing and using binoculars for deep sky observation talk for us next week which i think will be really interesting and kind of now the night skies are drawing in as well should be some nice objects for us to get some binoculars out and have a look at we look forward Excellent. to that one we certainly will look forward to seeing you again next week then steve so uh, all that remains for me to say then is richard again thank you very much indeed uh obviously we'll put the recording up um on the youtube channel as soon as uh, grant gets the minute to uh, do that and people can watch back um at their ledger actually it seems a bit strange you haven't got a book or something that you're trying to uh, uh <laughs> publicize is that usually we've got people on that are trying to sell books and web courses and all that sort of stuff no no, no. <laughs> you should be, you should be doing very it. boring <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely you well, in write, that case you, you should write one because you know, as i put it in the chat your enthusiasm is so infectious yeah. and there's a few people who put you know we wished you were our science <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Our most definitely. yeah most uh, definitely do it yeah, I, i'm not sure that the arm waving comes across quite so so quite so well when written down that's the problem i have to work on that <laughs> audio book <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully you've got some other talks, Richard, and we can have you back in the future. That would be an absolute pleasure. You've certainly exhausted my my uh, my astronomy for the moment, so I'll have to, I'll have to give that some thought. Lovely. Thanks a lot, guys. Night, night, Richard, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you, everybody. We'll see you all next week. See you soon. Cheerio. Bye bye.